Good morning, everyone. This stuff developer is stuck like just, just like you and me in multiple lockdowns. The first one is the COVID-19 lockdown that is on everybody's mind. And the other one is the other one is the Spark APIs lockdown. There are some who believe these lockdowns should be ended. And there are others who want to keep these lockdowns. And irrespective of their beliefs, there are many who have learned how to work with these lockdowns. It might be the essential service workers, or it might be you who has to go out to get groceries and the most important thing, the toilet paper. I don't know about you, but my team and me are definitely in this category. We have learned to work with the Spark APIs lockdown. And today I'm going to share two such stories of how we hit the Spark limitations and we worked around those. For me, this acceptance of working with the lockdowns comes from the fact that I love to meditate. I also like to read. I worked at Apple, Sumo Logic and Amazon before. And right now I'm working as a senior software engineer at Netflix. Netflix is a video on demand streaming service. We have more than 180 million members. And in 2019, we added more than 1000 original titles to our catalog. We use machine learning models to generate recommendations. And these machine learning models are data hungry. Let's see what sort of data are they looking for? The first data is the video metadata. Let's think about Stranger Things. In Stranger Things, there are multiple seasons and each of those seasons has multiple episodes in it. This information about how many seasons it has and how many episodes does each season have is contained in the video metadata. Today, we are going to assume that this video metadata, this entire information about the video data is 10 gigabytes, exactly 10 gigabytes. And whenever required, we are going to load this information into the JVM because it can be. We don't want to pay the network cost of having to make a network re request to actually access this data. The second data is about the members. There are more than 180 million members. And for them, we have their viewing history. We have the thumb ratings, whether you give thumbs up or thumbs down to Stranger Things. This data is in terabytes. It cannot be loaded into one JVM. Let's see how this data gets used to generate the recommendations. Viewing history and video metadata combined are used to generate the features online. Once we have the features, then we can compute the recommendations by scoring on those features. Once we have computed the recommendations, we can show those to the user. While we were doing the online feature generation, we take snapshot of the member data and put it into the historical data store. And from there, we can recompute the features. Why do we do this? Because this helps us improve our exp uh, exploration uh, speed. We can change a feature, we can add a new feature. Once we have done that, we can actually, uh, we can compute new features. And once we have computed the new features, we can train the model and we can send the updated model to recompute the fresh recommendations. Today, our focus is going to be this offline feature generation spark job. And to know more about the limitations that we hit during this offline feature generation spark job, we need to know what it did, what it is trying to do. It is trying to replicate the online feature generation spark job, sorry, the online feature generation job. And this replication, and this replication is what we are trying to achieve faster. Let's dig more into the online feature generation spark job, uh, online feature generation job. Let's visualize it on a timeline. So we have on a timeline, let's assume that this is a 24 hour timeline. And from there, we have, we, we want to compute the recommendations for member one. For the member one, we have the viewing history of the member. And then we want to get the video metadata for the member. This, we, not for the member, this is the video metadata, the entire catalog. This is 10 gigabytes. Now we have loaded this 10 gigabytes into the memory. Why do, and from this, from the viewing history and video metadata, we can compute the features for member one. 
why do we have this 10 gigabytes of data sitting in memory? Why don't we compute the recommendations for member two, three, four? Now, at some point during the day, we would add a new video to our catalog that we are releasing on an average more than two. We, we are adding more than two videos every day. That just means at some point during the day, it's inevitable we, will, we would have something added. Now, we, that means the video metadata would change and we need we would have a new version of video metadata. Let's assume we download this 10 gigabytes again into the memory. And with that, we can compute the recommendations for member five and member six. The same goes for member seven and member eight with version three. Now let's take this data and put it into a data frame. We have this data in the data frame. In this, notice that H1 is its in entirety, but M1, when we talk about the video metadata, it is only the version of video metadata. This is done because we cannot put 10 gigabytes in each and every row, that's too much data. While H1 is much smaller in size, so we can put H1 in its entirety, but M1 is just the version. Let's load this data into the offline feature generation Spark job. And with that, we want to now look, this, look at this problem from the perspective of Spark. We know what we are trying to achieve. We need to know what happened in Spark. So for the, oh, let's take it from the top. We have the driver and driver is trying to communicate with the executors. Within each executor, we have multiple cores. So there are three cores. Within each core, we have, over time we are running tasks, task one, task two, task three. And when we talk about the task, within the task, we are trying to run over a partition of the data. From the previous data frame, we have H4, M1, H5, M2. Now, we said M1 is not in its entirety. So we have M1, just the version. So we need M1 somewhere in the executor. Let's say we have put this M1 right there in the executor, and then we can access it. So the M1 can be accessed. With this, we, the same thing applies for M2. So we have M2 and M, M, M2 sitting in the executor's memory and we can access it. And with that, we can generate the features for member four and member five. Wait, this is a bit different from the online feature generation. In the online feature generation, we had only one of these versions in memory at one point. Either it was M1 or it was M2 or it was M3. But now we already have two versions in memory. That, that means instead of consuming 10 gigs, we are already consuming 20 gigs. Our task today is to optimize this memory consumption without having an impact on the performance. With this, let's dig deeper into the executor. Let's take this executor and see what's going on. At this instance in time, this executor is running task one, task two, task three. And we have all of the three versions that we need in memory, M1, M2, and M3. Let's assume that task one needs access to M1, task two needs access to M1. So both task one and task two need access to M1. Task three need, needs access to M2. If we see with closure, we have both two copies of M1 in memory. That just means that we are wasting 10 gigabytes extra. We could have done on the left-hand side, we could have done with 20 gigs, but we are consuming 30 gigs. So let's take the second option. Let's try to broadcast the data, which is a second memory option that Spark provides. We have 30 gigs again, because some row is going to need access to M3. So we broadcast both or everything, M1, M2, and M3. On this executor, at this instance, M3 is not required. But with broadcast, we have to broadcast everything. First of all, we cannot broadcast 30 gigs, but let's say with lazy loading, we can get 30 gigs in the user memory. With this, again, we are consuming 30 gigs. Why we could have done with 20 gigs by just having M1 and M2, but M3 is also coming along and that's wasting memory. So the Spark limitations that we are hitting are, 
The first one is that Spark has limited memory sharing options. And the second one is there is no option to select. So the second one is Spark does not let us control where a particular task lands. So if we could choose that, we could say that all of the tasks that need access to M1 go to the first three executors. All of the tasks that need access to M2 go to the next three executors. Or M3 go to executor 7, 8, 9, 10. And that would have worked. But Spark does not let us control where a particular task lands. It's very random. But why these are the Spark limitations? What we do get are multiple data wrangling tools from Spark. And they are repartitioning, materializing the intermediate data frames, and sorting within partitions. In today's talk, we are going to try all three of them. The first three approaches that we are going to talk about, then they don't work. The fourth one is tending towards the solution, but it does not work fully. Approach five is the one that is going to work. So pay attention to approach four and five. On approach one, we have taken the data frame that we had initially, and we have broken down into three partitions, partition N1, N2, and N3. For partition N1, we are going to try to put this into an executor, and we have task one that is trying to execute partition N1. As we can see, M3, so partition N1 needs M3, M3, and M1. So in this case, first we'll download M3 into the memory. Once we reach the row three, where we have H1 and an M1, we would download M1. Now this is 10 gigabytes of data. Downloading this data into memory is going to take finite amount of time. Let's assume that's one minute in today's talk. Let's assume that whenever we download this a new version in memory, that takes one minute. That's if we had way, if we had more rows in this partition, we'll be switching from M3 to M1 to M5 to M7 and then back to M1. That's inefficient. Let's see what happened on, on other tasks. On task two, we need M2 and then M1, and task three, we need M1 and M2. This, all of this is inefficient. And again, we are still consuming 30 gigs. Let's see, see if we can actually consume just 20 gigs of executor memory. We've got that win. But this, with this, we are consuming 30 gigs and we are switching between versions on the same partition. So let's try to repartition this data. For this, we are going to assume that we are partitioning by version and we have broken down the data for version one into two partitions because it's too much data. So we have partition R1A and partition R1B for version one. For version two, we have partition R2A and so on. So with the repartitioning, let's try to use the closure approach, the first approach that we saw. Again, task one is trying to access M1, task two is trying to access M1 because both of them are working on partition R1A and partition R1B. So they're working on data for version one. And task three is working on uh, is working on M3, it needs M3. Again, we are still consuming 30 gigs of data of why the task is to go to 20 gigs because M1 is replicated twice. On top of that, we are paying an extra penalty of repartitioning the data. Repartitioning is slow. So we don't want to do that, but uh, with that, we do see that we have stopped switching between versions. Let's go to uh, try this a different way. In this case, we are going to materialize the data frames. So we are going to split the execution by version. So on, uh, what we would do is we have M1, every task that needs M1. So every partition that has a version M1, we'll execute that first and we'll materialize that data frame. So we have stage one. In that case, we are broadcasting M1 to all of the executors. And then we work through task one and task two, which are partition R1A and partition R1B. In this case, we can see that one third of the executor is empty. In a, we have three cores on this executor and only two of those cores are getting used. The third one is empty because we do not have any more work to do right now. And then we have stage two. On stage two, we are broadcasting M2 and then we are, part, we are working on partition R2A and task one. In this case, two thirds of the executor is empty because while we could have worked on the partition is for version three, we cannot do that because we need to finish off M2. 
this is highly performance efficient oh, sorry highly performance inefficient while it is highly memory efficient in this case we are just consuming 10 gigabytes of memory in each and every step we are not going above 10 gigabytes but this resource wastage manifests itself as performance inefficiency in this case the entire spark job takes about 10 hours while the final solution takes about one hour so this is we did not like this approach we moved on to a different one at this point we gave up on all of the options that spark provides us for memory management and we decided to implement our own this custom memory management it's a layer that sits between task one task two and between the task and the user memory so task one is going to actually talk to this custom memory management and say that can i get access to m1 this custom memory management sees that oh m1 is not in memory so it downloads m1 and then returns the pointer to task one then task two comes and requests for the same thing for m1 but m1 already exists in memory so the custom memory management just returns the pointer with task three, it downloads the custom memory management, downloads M3 and returns that. This is good. In this case, we can actually limit the amount of memory that we are consuming by putting a semaphore. So this custom memory management can say that, oh, I am not, never going to have more than 20 gigabytes in memory. I'm not, not going to have more than two versions in memory that limits it to 20 gigabytes. There's only one problem with this approach. It works in every other way that we are repartitioning the data and repartitioning the data can be slow. So we would use this custom memory management in the final solution, but we did not want to have repartitioning. This particular custom memory management is implemented using a singleton so that all of the tasks are talking to, the, to this custom memory management layer. Let's look at the working approach. In the working approach we decided to get away from repartitioning the data we decided to use sort within partitions when we are sorting within partitions partition n1 which we saw which has m3 m3 and m1 now becomes partition m1 m3 m3 so what we are doing is we are saying that we sort by the versions the metadata version m1 m2 m3 in that order and we we can use this in conjunction with the custom memory management. Let's see how that works. On a timeline, we have partition S1, S2, and S3. With that, at this point in time, all of, when we start, all of the versions, oh, sorry, all of the partitions, S1, S2, and S3, need access to the same version, which is M1. And we can see that task one, task two, and task three, all of them need access to M1. Towards the end, as the time moves on task one needs access to m3 task two and task three need access to m2 task let's see task three task three moved from version one to version two so it moved from m1 to m2 while task two was still working on version one because it has three rows let's assume that uh, task two was uh, still working on version one now because task two, sorry, task three has already requested for M2, task two can use that time to complete working on M1. Let's see the overall advantages of this. So we have task one, task two, and task three, first accessing M1, and then task one accessing M3, task two and three accessing M2. In this case, we are being memory efficient because we can restrict the amount of memory we are using because we are going through the custom memory management. We are not repartitioning. Sorting within partitions, partitions is much faster than repartitioning. While we are switching between versions on, uh, on the same partition, which we have said is a bad thing, this cost is highly amortized because task two and task, uh, task, two and task three are going to need access to the same one. And if task three requested for M2, task two is still going to be able to use the same thing. The efficiency of this system increases as we increase the number of cores. So if we have 20 cores and just six versions required, in that case, 
our efficiency is very high. Why? If the number of cores are small, let's say we have five cores and 15 versions, the efficiency may not be that much. For us, the efficiency was that high that we did not have to even implement the semaphore. So as of now, we do not have the semaphore implemented. In, in this case, so uh, our problem statement was that Spark has two limitations. First is that Spark provides us limited memory sharing options. And second is uh, Spark does not let us control where a particular task lands. And what we decided to, uh, how we fixed this problem by actually uh, implementing our own custom memory management solution. Let's move to our second problem statement for the day. We want to get reliable metrics and improve the efficiency of debugging while working with Spark jobs. Your back, uh, the first thing I want to give a shout out to my teammate, David Patel, who implemented this. We are back to our, our recommendations architecture. And in this particular section of the talk, we are going to focus on the interaction between the historical data store and the offline feature generation. Let's see this interaction. We, we saw the offline feature generation now, and we saw how uh, it interacts with Spark. In this case, let's summarize this. The first step in this is getting the labels. The second step is to actually get the historical data. So the label information says, did a member watch, uh, did a member watch Stranger Things or not? And if they did, did they like it or not? That is the label information. From that, we go and fetch the data for the member from the historical data store. With that, we can regenerate the features as required. Now, when we're regenerating out of these three steps, there's only one step that actually ends up materializing the data frame. That is this generate features. This helps query planner to optimize the query because we are only materializing at one step. Query planner can reorder the query. In this case, if generate features is actually doing a filter based on some label information and not based on the historical data, query planner may decide to move that up. And if there's a part in uh, historical data that is not used by the generate features, but it is part of the final output. In that case, it may move that after the generate features. So query planner has a lot of leverage to move things around. The, and this query planner reordering is going to cause issues. We'll see that. In, in the meantime, I do want to highlight one more thing. We do accept a small amount of data drop. What does that mean? Let's say we had 100,000 rows in the first step in the data uh, information. Now, a historical data store is built on top of a cache. So we are caching and that cache can sometimes lose tiny amounts of data. What if we say that oh, 100 rows dropped out of those 100,000, it's okay. We'll move on, we'll continue with uh, the process. But if we lose 20,000 rows, that's 20% of the data drop, we do not want to continue. We want this job to fail. The, uh, we'll make, and this is a problem in Spark. Why? In Spark, it's zero or one. Either all of the 100,000 rows come out or nothing comes out. So, but you may say, oh, why don't you use flat map? Yes, we can use flat map, we do. But at the same time, we want to record the sample failures. If 100 rows drop, we want to know which 100 rows drop. If 20,000 rows drop, we just want to know some sample, let's say 500 of those. We do not want to record out of the 20,000 because that would pollute the logging. And Spark does not make that easy. Spark does not make logging sample failures easy. Let's see overall, how does the Spark job look like? If we have this offline feature generation, how does a Spark job from that look like? This is one of the sample Spark jobs that we have. In this case, we have 70, more than 70 stages. And remember what we talked about, query planner may have reordered stuff. We don't know where each of those steps 
happened if the gen was parts of generate feature happened in the first 20 or was it just the label information so let's assume that this spark job fades and we want to debug why it fade due to the query planner's optimization this is going to be very hard we cannot debug on top of that or we can we can we cannot debug easily on top of that uh, we, we do push out accumulators in each of these steps, but Spark does not provide us. It's very hard to know what was executed and Spark does not have a consolidated view for the accumulators. So at each of those steps, we are pushing out some accumulators and we want to see those accumulators, but with 70 different steps, we have to click through each one of those to find out where those accumulators manifested. We cannot see them in one view. And that takes forever to debug. On top of that, accumulators are not trustworthy. They can debug count. And we already talked about this one, that there's no easy way to record sample failures. At this point, we decided to implement our own solution for this. And in this case, we decided to implement our own solution. From the drivers, we send the accumulators to Kafka and then to Hive. In this case, the accumulators that we are sending are, we are only sending when a stage actually changes some accumulators. We do not send from the stages that do not have any accumulators. From the executors, we record the partial data failures and send those to Hive. With this, we are able to actually build a consolidated view. We can just enter the application ID and know what happened. We can see what stages got executed. We can see what steps got executed and get the accumulators for those. And at the same time, if the accumulators show that there was a, a, a large number of failures, in that case, we can actually get the partial data failures. On top of that, when we talk about the accumulators, we said they can double count. So we do not really trust the accumulators as such. We actually look at the accumulators as ratios. Most of the time, when the failures happen, they happen together and the double counting also happens together. So the ratios are way more reliable than the exact accumulator values. There's another thing that we do. We send the metrics from the executors to Atlas. Atlas is the Netflix open source time series database. The advantage of sending these metrics to Atlas is now if there are multiple Spark jobs, they can be this offline feature generation and there they can be multiple flavors of those that for different purposes. In that case, we can actually build metrics and graphs on top of multiple jobs. So having all of these metrics in Atlas provides us more debugging information if the failures are happening across multiple jobs. So the implementation of this is done using the Spark stage listeners and task listeners. As I already said, we only send information from the uh, driver to Kafka if there's a change in the accumulators. So we are deduplicating the login. There's an interesting gotcha. Spark listeners catch through it, but that's a story for some other time. The overall advantages that we see of this approach are that we can have a consolidated view of the dogs and accumulators. It's easy to detect what pieces of code were executed. And this overall has reduced us debugging time significantly. Your feedback is important to us. Please do not forget to rate the session. So with this, I want to remind you what we talked about. We talked about three different Spark limitations. The first one is that Spark has limited memory sharing options. The second one is that in Spark, we cannot control where a task lands on what executor does a task land. And the third one is that it's, it can be hard to debug in Spark because, because Spark does not have the tools that we needed. So what we did is we implemented these two solutions that you see in front of your screen. What, answer, what questions can I answer for you? Thank you.